Reformed theologian John Calvin wrote as the very first point of the very first section of the very first chapter of his Institutes of the Christian Religion, without knowledge of self, there is no knowledge of God. The problem is we assume we understand who we are when we really don't. We seldom question the lens through which we see the world, where it came from and how that lens has shaped our lives. And we seldom question whether the vision of reality the lens has provided is distorted or true. We often remain unaware of the things that helped us survive as children, but hold us back as adults. We have a tendency to get in our own way for the simple reason that the ego cannot solve the ego's problems. Spiritual practices have arisen over the centuries for the purpose of helping us get out of our own way and become who we were created to be. One such ancient practice is the Enneagram, a model of the human psyche involving nine interconnected personality types. The Enneagram goes at least as far back as the Desert Fathers before making its way via Sufis and the Jesuits into modern psychotherapy. The Enneagram helps people to understand who they are and why they see and relate to the world in the way that they do. Those familiar with Richard Rohr's daily meditations may have noticed that at least once a year he mentions the Enneagram and some years goes into it with more depth than others. Knowing Father Richard to be a great resource for spiritual practices, when I first encountered it in one of his meditations, I proceeded to research the Enneagram further. I had a hard time getting my arms around the subject. To make a long story short, it made my head hurt. In February 2019, I attended a workshop on the Enneagram at the Jung Society, led by Marilyn Finch Williams. The light bulb went on and I came to see the Enneagram for the tool that it is. I came to understand that the truth of the Enneagram is based on the relationship between our sins and our saving graces. And I came to appreciate the insight it provides into the workings of my shadow. I also came to see how the Enneagram can be, and often is, woven into other practices, such as spiritual direction and the examine. In short, Marilyn's workshop was ibuprofen for my psyche. This is no surprise. Marilyn has studied extensively with such pioneers in the field as Helen Palmer, David Daniels, and Richard Rohr. She has spent the last 24 years using the Enneagram in her therapy practice, and she has had countless Enneagram students over the years. One of Marilyn's stated passions is to facilitate the revival of the Enneagram practice in churches. It is with great pleasure that the Center for Spiritual Deepening welcomes Marilyn and provides her with another opportunity for living out her passion. So thank all of you for attending, and I can't see all of you, but um, most of you, and I'm very glad that you're here. And um, I have been an Enneagram teacher for about 26 years, and I've presented it in more places than I can count, but this is the first time I've done it online. So I'm a little bit, it feels a little bit like my first time presenting it. And um, I have to hide my self view. I don't think <laughs> I don't want to be fixing my hair here all the time. Anyway, um, so I wanted to thank Lisa and Russell for their technical support. And I have a few housekeeping details that I want to run by you. Um, I want to request that people not use the chat except if they have a technical issue. Um, that and to contact either Russ or Lisa who are on there like occasionally if something happens and you the sound goes out or you go out or something like that to please contact them and I won't be if you have a question for me we're going to be doing those out loud um, and not to use the chat for that because I'm not going to distract myself by looking at it I'm still mastering this technology so um, with the hand raising, there'll be a point at which I'm gonna be asking questions and 
probably we will do a combination of you can raise do people know how to raise let me walk through how you raise your hand um, on the zoom platform you press participants and you can push raise hand but i also can see most of you and um I'm, you can also put your hand up like this so i'm going to ask you to do that first when we get to participation but feel free to use either one. Okay, I'll be checking both. Um, we will be recording this. I'm, we're going to ask that everybody try to be as conscientious as you can to leave your um, your audio on mute. And unless you want us to overhear your your family's going on <laughs> and but to leave it on mute. And um, but then we, we will be recording this and people um, we, if, if you have any objection, when it comes to the time where participation happens, people will be sharing some, maybe sharing some rather deep stuff if they choose to. And if there's any, if anybody ends up sharing something, I mean, we want people to be as comfortable as they, they can doing that. But if, if there's something afterward that you prefer your part be edited out when we use the video, just please let us know afterward. Okay, because we want to honor everybody's privacy. So any um, any questions about the housekeeping details on that? And you raise your, I'm, I'm just probably only going to look at your pictures, but my people will see if there are any hands that are raised, right? People? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Uh, Tonight, what I'm the, the structure of this, if you're able to come to all three classes, it's not, as um, Lisa said in the letter she sent you all, it's not necessary that you come to all three um, to get something out of it. So people can come, people you know wanted to attend tonight but couldn't, they can attend the next two Mondays. But tonight is the night that I'm going to be talking, the most talking I'm going to do, which is to introduce the Enneagram system to you. But the value for me in this system, I learned it in something called the narrative tradition, which means that the types themselves are both teacher and student. So we learn actually about the Enneagram from you guys and, and talking about the types. So after I do the presentation of what the Enneagram is, hopefully it'll be more of you guys interacting with each other. And I was thinking today as I was planning this presentation that this really isn't um, a, a uh, class on the Enneagram. It's really a class on learning more about yourself as, as Russ alluded to, you know, to know God, you have to know yourself. And um, so this is more about using it in the spiritual transformation to know yourself but the issue is you have to learn about the enneagram in order to know yourself so that's what we'll be spending the first um 25 minutes giving you a, a rough sketch of that um and you a couple caveats you may or may not know your type after you leave this if you don't know your type already and there, there's a reason for that. Um, you guys probably, you got the inventory. I don't know how many of you were able to do that or some reading beforehand. But one, this is to me one of the strengths of the type is that because the Enneagram is essentially a system that, it, that it's a tool that we can use to awaken to our blind spots then you know it actually invites you to become engaged in the process of self-observation. And if this is introducing us to that which we're not already aware, then it takes a while to do that. And it may not come, you know, right away. And if you took the inventory and followed the directions, you know, you'll have, you know, some confidence in some of the choices and some in others. But if you've gone online to take some of the Enneagram tests that are out there, uh, they, they really actually only have a certain statistical probability and the type is more verified in a one-on-one -on -one con con confirmation or going through um, 
some of the reading and stuff like that to verify the type. So even the inventory I sent you, which was developed at Stanford, if you check certain boxes that there's still only like a 70% probability you're that type because it, it requires further exploration. And for me, that that really is actually the strength of the type. It's not what we're used to. We want to be take a test like the Myers-Briggs or something and then be told what we are. But the Enneagram is a system where you need to find out about your personality, not be told by somebody else what it is. So it's really an exploration, but it, just to let you know, you may or may not come away with your type um, during this course. The Enneagram is, is a description of nine types. Any literally means um, nine and gram means model or representation. So it's simply a model of nine types and you'll be seeing that soon. And it is a description of the type is arrived at by understanding motivations, not behavior, okay? And so that's one of the reasons that it's tricky that we, we may not be, we can be aware of our behavior, uh, but we may not be aware of what motivates the behavior. And the example I like to use, I, I taught this once to a, a group at the American Bar Association that asked me to come in and um, present it in a team building kind of stuff that they were using. and around the table, for instance, I, I asked how many people were interested in making name partner and that kind of thing in their firm. And there were a lot of them in the room who were. And I asked each one of them what was motivating that. And so the external behavior was, was identical. But behind everybody's motivations were, well, like there's more financial security and being financial and professional security and being a name partner. Well, how could I not be a name partner? Because what will people think of me if I don't make nine name partner in five years? Um, well, my father was a name partner and I need to be too. There were just, it, you can see how you have a similar behavior of striving for a certain goal, but it's motivated by many different things. And that's really where the Enneagram lives. And a lot of people aren't aware of their motivation. So we tend to type people um, by behavior. and. That's okay. So um, that's, I think that's all I want to say about that. And then now, I would, before we go into the material, what I'd like to do is, um, Russ, can you bring up the, the optimal learning sheet? I'm going to go through this rather rapidly. I think I mentioned I usually teach this in a two day format. So I'm going to be giving you enough that I hope will whet your appetite for further study. Okay, guidelines for optimal learning. Be as centered or grounded inside yourself as you possibly can and simply present to what's going on. Embody a stance of respect and regard. Have an open, receptive mind, a non-judging stance characterized by listening to others as they are to themselves. Have an open, receptive heart open to an empathetic understanding of others with a compassion for, being, for their being and dilemmas. Show curiosity, have a spirit of genuine inquiry and a hunger to learn. Anticipate benefit, have an expectation of personal gain and value. Give effort, come from the energy of motivation. And the learning objectives, can you scroll that up a little? Okay. Um, I'm going to go over these and point out the, the few that will not be achieved during this course due, due to its brevity. Um, to look, this, the, the following represents a set of personal learning objectives. It's not intended to be exclusive or exhaustive, just typical. To learn about and understand this most fundamental and powerful of typologies and its application in your healthy development, your relationships, and your work to identify your own type, especially your pattern of attention and how it limits and benefits you, to acquire observational practices and skills to further your personal relationships and spiritual development, to heighten your acceptance of yourself and others through understanding how each of us actually operates, to build understanding and utilization of personal reactions for reducing stress, better self-management and improving effectiveness, to gain an appetite for further Enneagram study. That's a big one for tonight um, and, and the next three nights. 
to learn specific practices for working with your type. This will not happen um, in, this, in this course. Um, and to understand and work with the influence of subtype centers of intelligence and wings. And some of that will happen in this course and some is for greater you know, learning in the future. Okay, the ethics one, Russell. Okay, th this is sort of a soapbox issue for me because um, when um, there, there's a lot of ways that I think the Enneagram is misused and I supervise a lot of students. So I tend to get on a soapbox about certain things and I'll explain that to you. It's important to consider the ethical parameters since most of us are ambivalent about being typed. We all need to remember that typing in some form is inevitable, that people who don't believe in typing are actually categorizing people into two types, those who type and those who don't type. Ethical use of the Enneagram. Be sure that typing doesn't devolve into stereotyping, into labeling resulting in prejudice. Be sure to respect privacy and personal boundaries of participants Avoid fault finding or excuse making for behavior based on type. Keep key objectives in mind and do not get sidetracked by type issues. That'll make more sense to you later. Um, see other sources of issues in addition to the Enneagram. Avoid using the Enneagram for personal agendas and recognize that the Enneagram requires commitment, effort, and time. Be very cautious of using the Enneagram in any selection process in either personal or professional relationships. Level of development and willingness to work on issues are more important than type per se. And I will elaborate on that because some of that may make, it has no relevance to what we're doing here tonight. But the main thing that I really work to get across to my students and want to get across to you, and, and some people are disappointed when they hear this, but you can't type another person. Um, it, and you, it's an inevitable, Thing that you will try to. And the reason for that is twofold, that this as a spiritual tool, as Rus Russell alluded to, you know, has a long history, you know, in the Desert Fathers and in the Sufi tradition, and that the it is a tool for self-observation. And I, I'm not a Catholic, but I, I understand that the examine is like that. Is that correct, Russell? That, that, you know, this is primarily meant for your use and your use to in your own spiritual and formational work. And so that the, one of the things that inevitably follows is, is somebody will say, well, now that I've learned this, my husband is of this and, you know, my daughter's of this. And you may be right in the sense that you know them very well. But it, it's still, in, in my opinion, a misuse of the tool, you know, that, and um, that this is really just more to learn more about yourself. So um, that makes sense to everybody? All right. So I think, let me start with these quotes. Uh, when I do this in person, I usually start this is part of my handout, but these are the key factors for fundamental change are easily understood, but not necessarily easily adopted. Awareness that releases ingrained habit, commitment, and accountability that surmount difficult times, caring for the well being of self and others, and of course, knowing that change is possible and will make a difference. We don't see the world the way it is we see it the way we are. No problem ever gets solved by the same consciousness that caused it. And three laws of behavior, energy follows attention and changes with situations. Management of attention, energy and behavior requires self-observation and self-observation can be taught but never becomes habitual. Okay. So now onto the Enneagram, if you could take, actually, if you could take that down for a minute, because I'd like to see everybody, Russell, I'm, I want to go to the diagram next, but I, I, can I get a show of hands about how many people have never heard of or studied the Enneagram or anything like that? You're totally new to the system tonight. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I will be teaching this 
to the beginners and yet uh, there's no time I've been teaching it for 26 years and I still learn new stuff about it when I learn it. So I, I don't think you'll be bored in that, but, um, and how many people know their, uh, who know the Enneagram, how many people think they know their type? Okay. Okay, good. Then we'll have a lot of participants tonight when it, you can, you'll make excellent teachers of the types. <laughs> Um, when I was first introduced to the Enneagram, um, I had been professionally trained. It was back in 1992. And I had been professionally trained by someone, not in the Enneagram, but in, in my therapeutic practice, by someone who was an out-of-the-box thinker. And he was someone, I was very drawn to him in part because of that. And he sort of eschewed things like diagnoses that are heavily used in my profession um, and more because that there was a tendency, I, I think maybe not so much now, but then that diagnoses were more used to label people than to help them out, out of their dilemmas. And so that I really, when people kept telling me about the Enneagram, um, I didn't know how it was any different than knowing I was a Sagittarius and I was very skeptical. And ironically, of course, it turns out that my type is one that refuses to be put into a box and I insist on being unique. So that was a display of my type. You know, I have this sort of, you know, don't, don't tell me I'm like anybody else. Um, and, you know, many people like me, but they're not like me, you know, and uh, all that kind of thing. So um, it, it's, it had to bring itself I had to expose myself to it. And the thing that really got me hooked is I walked into a, a conference once that I, in a previous incarnation, I was a uh, event planner and I helped a friend of mine who was bringing Helen Palmer to town. I helped her negotiate the hotel contract and she gave me free admission to the Enneagram. And the day I went, the panel of people that were speaking were my type. And I thought they'd been reading my mail. I had never heard anybody, you know, I thought I, this is, this was uncanny and I was hooked after that. So um, that's any questions up to this point before I get into the system itself? I mean, probably haven't given you enough to ask a question yet, but any hands go up there? Anything unclear about what I've said already? Okay. Um, I think Russ gave a, do people call you Russ, Russ? Ru okay. Um, Russell, <laughs> that he gave a good description of how this functions, you know, what its main purpose is. And it's, as I said, it's a tool for self, um, not other self, not other recognition. It's a system of nine personality types representing the spectrum of the human condition. There are many ways to talk about it and use it. I could write a dissertation probably on any of the concepts that I'm gonna bring up tonight. But the title of this particular class was Using the Enneagram in Spiritual Transformation and it can be used as a helpful tool. Richard Rohr says, anybody who doesn't value the Enneagram either doesn't understand it or hasn't learned it well. What he talks about a lot is that what all spiritual paths have in common is trying to uncover the false self to be able to see what the true self is. And the idea is that through being a human being that we've all had to develop an ego, a personality. There's some people in, in here with me that we study a system where we talk about, we each have a false belief about ourselves. But for the first half of life, that personality, that identity formation is part of our development. And we are automatic with that belief that the way we see the world is the way it is. We, we don't have that self-observational capacity until, well, the prefrontal cortex isn't fully formed until we're at least 25. So we don't have the capacity even to self-observe to see that the way we think about the world isn't true. So it, this is a little bit reductionistic in the way I view it, but essentially most spiritual paths have the idea that we have a false self 
and a true self that was created in God and however you define God to be. And that, that this, the Enneagram really provides us a tool and Roar again calls it a tool for subtraction. So that if you know what's not true, then you can let that go and be more available to what is. We don't have to do anything about the true self. That's already there. It's already pure. It's already um, good enough. <laughs> and it's only the personality that might tell us otherwise. And so I'm sure those of you, because you're in this spiritual community are well aware of that. So the, so the Enneagram is really um, a tool to help us know what is dividing us from knowing the truth. Some people will say dividing us from knowing God, those kinds of things. And um, I tell a story, some of you have probably heard it about the, the guy who is on his hands and knees under a street light looking for something and, and a passerby comes and says, um, what are you looking for? And he says, I'm looking for my keys. And inevitably the person said, well, well, where did you last see them? And he said, well, up the street. And the guy said, well, why are you looking here? And he said, because the light is better. And, and whatever type we're born, um, and I do believe we're born our type, our temperament, but whatever type we're born, we spend sort of the first half of life looking where the light is better. And in the second half of life, we have this opportunity to see um, more where, where the keys really are lost. So being human is, is to have an ego, is to have this false self. And they're enlightened beings, whether it's you know, Vishnu, Jesus, Buddha, and probably a lot of others who didn't, who I like to say didn't have as good a PR, um, <laughs> have, they had movements built around their teachings. And the idea is that they were enlightened. They had gotten beyond the ego. And so that we, we have this ego, which the, the Enneagram represents these nine types. And each type has what, I'm gonna, what is called a sin. You'll see when you uh, see the diagram is that the seven deadly sins are seven of the types. And then there are two, what we call generic types. So each type has a sin, which it here is defined. It's not something you do wrong, something you're punished for. It's anything that separates you from knowing the truth and the truth being God. So when, when, how this works in spiritual formation is that when we are able to identify our type, that there's a certain energy associated with each type. And if we can observe our, if we use the tool to recognize, oh, that's my ego, and it wakens you up to that, and then you, we usually are just, since it's mo the truth most of our life, we're following that with the energy, um, that, and we act on that belief. But once we see it, and energy follows attention, so once we pay attention to the way the type shows up in us, the way our ego shows up, the way the false self shows up and not act it out. The idea is that energy then becomes available for conversion. Um, and that may not make sense yet, but I, the, one of the examples that I like to use is um, my, my daughter happens to be a one on the Enneagram and she probably never never walks in. She will often walk in a room that I've been in, and this literally happens. And she'll, she'll walk right over to the wall and straighten whatever picture is crooked. And she will do that. And she can't not do, well, she cannot do it, but she can't not notice it. That's the point I'm trying to make. So a, a, a very prosaic example of, but sitting with the energy is that, if you were really gonna make that a conscious practice, for instance, you would watch the crooked picture and notice it and then sit with the energy of not doing anything about it. That would be an excellent spiritual practice to see then in, in some kind of stillness practice. The idea is that that would then transform into the energy of serenity. So each type has a, um, has an energy and, and uh, 
driver that if it's not acted upon actually will convert to what's called their higher opposite and each type has a higher opposite. So the idea would be eventually my daughter might sit down long enough and realize that the world did not come to an end because that picture is still crooked and, and have this conversion experience. So that energy becomes available for that. So that is one of the, the ways that it is used in spiritual transformation. Does that, does that make sense to people? It does not, okay. All right. When we get more into the types, what I will do is try to explain that more. Um, unless you, if you have a specific question around that now, I can go a little deeper. I, I can tell you that I did not un have any understanding of it when that was first presented to me. So if you want to just stay tuned, we can continue. You can come back to it unless you feel like you can't take anything in beyond that. Did it make sense to some people? Okay, the first thing I wanna explain, one of the keys to really understanding the Enneagram is the three centers of intelligence. And if you got the handouts, then you will, um, then you have a description in front of you. Not that I'm asking you to look at that while, <laughs> while I'm talking, but um, the, the, there was a man by the name of George Gurdjieff who lived um, from mid 19th century to mid 20th century. And some of you may have heard of him. There's a really interesting movie about him called um, The Meetings with Remarkable Men. And he is credited with being one of the first people to bring the Enneagram to the West, the Western thinking. And he claims that he, he learned it from Sufi masters. And he teaches something, he taught something called the fourth way. And some of you may even be in Gurdjieffian groups, they're still going on. The fourth way was based on the notion, and this is central to the Enneagram, that we are a three-brained being. And what that means is we have three centers of intelligence. We have a brain center or the head center, we're heart centered and we're gut or instinct centered. And the Enneagram is divided into triads, each, each triad belonging to a different center. So then this may help you if you don't haven't typed yourself, this, this will help you understand it. Um, so the, I'll start with the heart center because that's where we're gonna be starting tonight with the types. The heart center is the two, three, and four, okay? And the, the basic Enneagram model, this, this is the nine pointed star. The inner triangle is nine, six, and three, and everything is built off of that. And so the main heart type is the three and then two and four are what we call the wings of that type. And what, what these types have in common, this, these are all called the emotional centers. They have in common, uh, they are concerned with the perception of others and they are feeling based types they, that emphasize the heart for positive and negative concerns, empathy and concern for others, romance and devotion. There's focus is on relationship and this is um, and performing up to the expectations of the job or other people. So they're very focused on other people. So you might kind of know right away whether you're sort of in that triad or not, okay? The, the head centers, we we'll call the head centers or also called the intellectual centers, are the five, six, and seven. Also what they have in common is uh, their personalities sort of are the locus of control is around fear. Now all types have fear, but they're central in this type. And, and when we get to that, I will explain. Um, these are thinking based types, they're head types. They lead with ideas, gathering information, figuring things out, rational decision-making, before acting. And you know, that's all I wanna say about that. So an example would be um, uh, in, in this type that if you are a, a mental type, I, I have a friend who's a five on the Enneagram and she was stopped once at a, uh, somebody perceived that she had cut them off um, at a toll booth and the person got out of the car and came over to the car and was quite menacing to her. And when she's telling the story, she 
you know, I can't even remember what she said to the person, but it was such a pithy comment. You know, she was so poised and in her head, the kind of comment where if we heard the story, you know, be like, God, how do you think on your feet like that? And so she delivered the comment, the guy kind of slinked back to his car and, but then she had to pull her car over to the side of the road and started crying and shaking. Okay, so, so that was an, how the, it, we call these centers organs of perception. So the brain, the logical brain took in the information first, responded to it, and then, um, but then her other centers kicked in. Um, and another example is when I was first starting in my career, I worked with, I'm, I'm a heart type, I'm a four, I'll tell you that right now, um, and I'll out myself. <laughs> and when um, I first started my career, I worked with abused children, and I had a master's degree, I had some knowledge, but short of adopting them, I was a little bit of a mess, and I intuitively found my way to uh, the mentor that I referenced earlier, who was very much a head type. I, I believe he was probably a type five on the Enneagram. And I learned a lot about how to deal with these situations in a non-anxious way and through informed in my intelligence. And what I could then do is I certainly had compassion, but it helped balance out my heart that was sort of leading the way with, with a lot of, um, you know, a, what to do about it from a rational point of view. And those are, you know, what I found in my practice is that, and one of the things the Enneagram sort of impressed itself on me is the people I've been working with before I learned about the Enneagram were intuitively trying to balance out their centers in different ways. You know, that, that people who are all in their head um, may, you know, have gone to, um, religions that awoke their heart or, or practices or body practices, that sort of thing. So Gurdjieff taught this fourth way that was to bring these into the center. Um, the, the body centers are the eight, nine, and one, and they are also called the instinctual center. And they are also all have some degree of relationship with anger. And these, they lead with the body for movement, they feel things more in their gut and a gut level knowing their focus is on personal security and taking right action. Sometimes we call these types the shoot first, ask questions later, <laughs> but we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. So those are the three centers. Um, uh, you know, another quick example, if you're typing yourself, I was typing the boyfriend of a friend of mine and I was explaining just exactly what I had explained to you guys just now. And I said, for instance, the heart has a wisdom that the brain doesn't have. And he looked at me and said, oh, no way. And I, you know, it was like any self-respecting heart type that heard me say that would be, of course the heart has wisdom that the head doesn't have. But that was very telling in that it, it helped me type him, okay? All right, so. The diagram itself, and I'm just going to briefly go over this because we'll, we'll be able to use it a little bit later, is um, the, the main triangle, the inner triangle is the three, six, and nine, which are the three body centers. And then each of the types on either side of the, the center of the triangle are what are called the wings. So eight and one are wings of the nine, seven and five are wings of the six, two and four are wings of the three. The Enneagram, and again, all of this was, the Enneagram as a whole is, is a description of the human condition. So we all do all the behaviors. It's not like, you know, if the, a fear-based type that the rest of us don't get afraid or that feeler types don't use their head. It's, it's that um, we tended to get stuck in areas. Areas are problematic for us in, in the area that we have our personality. So what the arrows represent, and again, I invite people to see if this isn't true. If anybody took a look at Beatrice Chestnut's book, you know, when I was taught the Enneagram, the arrows were indicative of what they called stress and secure, any of you who know of Russ, Russ Hudson's work, um, 
you know, I think they talk about it, integration to disintegration, but in the observing of the human condition, what's noticed is that, okay, I'll use myself as an example, that as a four, under stressful conditions, I would take on the behaviors of a two. So the movement is with the arrow, okay? And that's something you just have to observe. And um, I, I became, uh, I have a lot of tendencies of being a giver, which means I, I was under stress for a lot of my life. In fact, I thought I was a two for when I first typed myself based on behaviors, because I'm a born caretaker and all the other stuff. But it turns out it was, it was a, a way of surviving that was based on the stress of my situation and my core stuff was four. Um, and then when, when defenses are loosened, then I would take on more of the behaviors of the one. And um, that, so as you learn your type, you can see if that's not true. The, the way Beatrice Chestnut describes that is that she doesn't talk about them as um, the movements with the arrows is disintegration and integration. She talks about that each one of them is holds an opportunity for growth. So it's not, there's less of a positive negative kind of thing, depending on it, that if, and the idea, one of the ways to use the Enneagram um, is to consciously try to pursue the direction of the arrows to take on those behaviors. And again, that will make more sense to you later, but um, I am gonna stop there and entertain any questions you have because it's about time, oh, I did it. I'm gonna move on to the heart type. So this is the time for any general questions, confusions. If you're totally lost, I'd like to know. Elisa, could, can you unmute yourself? That's good. Um, I didn't quite follow your. What Can you speak up just a touch? Um, okay. Let's say you're a four of the romantic. Mm -hmm. um, how does that arrow to whatever that thing, the professionist, how does that relate to how? you are in a situation or a problem or whatever are you trying to move toward in the direction of the arrow or how well um you're you're sort of asking like how to utilize it yeah. um okay well one the 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 wisdom of of this was based on observation of human condition it wasn't like somebody came up with this so the, the it it's it's predictive in the sense that if you identify your type, you are likely under, under certain con conditions of stress to take on the behaviors. Of, for me, it would be the two. And if I'm more relaxed and my defenses are down, that I'm more likely to operate, I can have more access to behave as a one. So that's just something that quote happens and you kind of have to see how it happens in your own life once you get to know your type. But Beatrice Chestnut talks a lot about as well as do some other authors that, uh, authors that you can actually consciously pursue some of the aspects of those types to, to um, broaden your repertoire of responses to life. So one of, one of the ways that, um, you know, I might, it's funny you asked about mine because um, in, in my more flaming days, Helen used to say we're our most flaming of our type in our late teens and early twenties, but it, you know, um, and I would be, my mood dictated pretty much everything I did. You know, I, I run my own business and I'm, I love working with my clients. It's sort of the admin stuff that, that is not my favorite. I mean, I, I'm, I can do it. But it's not, you know, and I would so much of my time, it would be, I, well, I just, I'm not in the mood. You know, I don't, I just don't want to, you know, Scarlett O'Hara here, I'm not in the mood. And doing the right thing would have been to get my clients bills out on time, you know, to sort of get over myself and to consciously pursue what was right 
you know, what I, I really needed to do from that point of view. And that's a, a very prosaic example. Um, though another example would be with the type one that's a perfectionist. And when we get there, it's sort of all, you know, they're sort of, I'll play when the work gets done. And the move to seven is the seven is sort of the, don't worry, be happy type. You know, if you have a lemon, make lemonade. And they, the, for a one to consciously move, to read about the seven and to consciously move to that, it just opens up, you know, so that you're not so stuck in your patterns. Okay. Is that helpful? Okay. And, and we'll talk more about that with each type. Any, any other questions? Margaret, you can unmute yourself. I've been through, um, you know, so much of this. I guess my main question is, you know, I've, I've seen myself as so many types, it's really hard. Okay. Know? Maybe that's one of the types, you know, cause you it actually is, but, but I, it's not, um, there is one, the, the nine is associated because they kind of are the mediators of the Enneagram and they kind of take on the behaviors of all types, but it's not, a, it's not a guarantee. I mean, there's no, that's not, yeah, because I had taken an Enneagram class, you know, and the like, does it change with your life with time? Like, can your type change as you get older? Okay, in, in my opinion, the answer is no, in the sense okay. that, um, that I think I believe we're born our temperament. And which, which one of the ways I have of describing it is that, you know, if I used to think like I, I grew up in an alcoholic family, for instance, and when I first read the four and identified it with it, it was sort of a side by side with the characteristics of adult children of alcoholics. I thought, oh, you know, the fear of abandonment, the whole deal. Right. So I thought all fours must be children of alcoholics. Right. So it, yeah, it's six, right. Well, see, I didn't recognize that yet. So then I went to um, that my first Enneagram training where with, as each type talked about themselves, there was a child of an alcoholic on each panel. So what, what that showed me is that our temperament, we will pick out and make meaning of our childhood, our growing up based on our type. But then when we get older, um, what, what I think happens is what what we do we change definitely we change i mean that's what the whole point of this is is to try to evolve beyond the ego's grip but we have to be aware of what where the ego is gripping us so the whole point of the enneagram is to know that the box you're in so that you can get out of it and so that we definitely change but i would argue that it's um and, and other people might not say the same thing, but I would argue that we go from, um, if, if any of you are uh, know Riso Hudson's work, they actually do a graph of the most um, uh, disintegrated to the most integrated of types, that we move within the type, that the structure of the ego and the false self actually loosens its grip on us so that we do change. So, you know, an example would be that, um, I have envy is the sin of the four type. And I used to have what I called kitchen envy, e eat in kitchen envy. You know, I would go to everybody's house and, and you know, if they had an eat in kitchen, I, I knew it's not that I'm jealous that they shouldn't have it. It's that I knew I would be happier if I had an eat in kitchen, right? So, I mean, there are a lot of ways. If you'd asked me if I was envious, I would have said no, because I didn't recognize it. I just thought I'd be happier. I had every, I didn't like the image of being envious. Now I, I, you know, I'm so far evolved, of course, I don't do that anymore. I don't, you know, I don't believe anything, what anybody else has. I don't believe that it would make me happy. You know, it, it's the inner world and all of that, but I can catch myself things like I envy the Dalai Lama. You know, I envy, you know, his, that he could walk through a burning village and still feel peaceful and go to sleep at night, you know, those kinds of things. And, you know, while that might be a, a wonderful role model to envy, it still is the assumption that the Dalai Lama is, is a per, is, it has something that I don't have innately in me. And this is based on the idea that we all have that capacity. And the Dalai Lama isn't better than I am, or you know, it's just development of that. So I believe we change, and the type has less of a grip on us. 
All right. Well, that that makes sense because, um, you know, and other people may tell you differently, but I don't believe we change types. I don't think we do either, but it's just, like there's always that core of who you are and how you're created. But but um, I know that, you know, I used to get confused thinking I was like a type two, mm -hmm. you know, and um, uh, because I used to just give, 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 you know, and yeah. I have that intuition about people in mm -hmm. general and I am a caregiver by trade, you know, that's what I do. <laughs> uh, but um, I don't know. I mean, you know, that's probably more of what I, you know, I don't, I don't feel like I'm a martyr about it though. Like I'm really good. Well, at you know, I, I would recommend, I don't know if you were able to get any of the books that, that um, I, I have the books. You know, I, and one of the reasons I really like Beatrice Chestnut's book is, and I'm not going to get into this tonight because when it was first introduced right. to me, I just went, you know, gaga, but that she calls it 27 paths to knowledge because each type has three subtypes and you can forget I ever said that once I've said it. Well, I'm actually a six with a subtype, which is that self-sexual wacky. Okay. So, so, you know, you know what your type is? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. All right. So, so, but the point about the subtypes is the reason I like Beatrice Chestnut's book is I would not have recognized my fourness in most of the way it's written about because they talked about fours as, you know, flamboyant and, and, and um, creative, artistic. I don't have an artistic bone in my body. And, and I would not have recognized from the surface stuff. But when I read the subtypes, which is the way the behavior shows itself, um, I was I was much more able to identify. So if any of you are, you know, continue or curious about this, I would really recommend her book because she talks a lot about that. So, any other questions? Thank you, Donna. Hi. Can How you, are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm good. I'm squinting at you because I have to do this on my phone for some reason. But oh, okay. anyway, um, I have a question. I I really don't know my type exactly but I've done this a couple times and get confused but okay. the last time I did it like uh, probably on this worksheet uh -huh. um you mean the one, the one that was sent out with the talk yes the yes okay. I had had it before okay. um it ended up with the three and the the second choice was a nine but now I look at those arrows and I go well that's crazy because if I really was a three, I was supposed to be evolving to a nine. Does that mean I get first and second place? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, nine, um, I wouldn't go exactly from those. And here, I'm glad, because uh, I, I happen to know Donna um, a little bit. And one of the things that I mentioned is that, pe that people who start to type themselves in the, you know, this what I call the second half of life, you know, when they done work on themselves there's been some evolving beyond your type which i think those of us who were you know whether we knew the enneagram or not i mean all, all of you are here because you're involved in some sort of you know spiritual awareness work and, and we tend to sort of evolve beyond our type um that it's harder to type yourself when you've done work on yourself because you know so what i have to do when i do a typing interview with somebody is say how were you were how were you in your 20s like i would never have known if you typed me now and somebody said are you envious i would say i'm not you know you'd have to dig pretty deep to find the dalai lama in there like i know happiness does not lie outside here i believe that right but i i so if i took the test now i might not see myself and so i know you've done a lot of work on yourself so i i don't we can talk about it more and what I would I would say is is in reading those to to read the sections of Beatrice Chestnut's book and sort of see which speaks to you. Um, and don't look don't let here's one key don't let the inventory tell you what you are. You just take the things that you you um, checked on the inventory It could be this that and the other and have that be the link to further research. Okay, um, a lot of used to the tests that tell us what we are. This, and this is what I love about it. We, when I type students, they can flunk their typing interviews if they try to nail the type with the person they're interviewing. They're supposed to send the person away with at least three types so that the person engages 
in the process of self-observation to learn it. 